welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Bud Elliott. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook network. Thanks for hanging out. And why don't you just go and give a high five and, and maybe maybe a little poke to that like button. Listen, subscribe, like, come and join us in the chat. This is a really, we are eventually going to get to a really fun part of the episode um, where we are going to be looking at teams that are going to have big turnarounds. Every single season, we see these uh, jumps from, you know, four wins, five wins. You go from being the middle of the pack to conference title contender from the bottom of the basement all the way into a bowl game or better. We are looking to identify the turnaround teams for 2023. We've got some candidates. We've got some teams to uh, debate and identify coming up in just a little bit. Tennessee, uh, just to keep slowly moving along its NCAA uh, Committee on Infra Infractions process. We got a little bit more news this week. Uh, but but we begin with reopening uh, the incredibly, incredibly tragic story from within the Georgia football program. Now with news uh, that is very pertinent to the NFL draft uh, and very pertinent probably to just sort of the, the way that we are approaching the two-time national champions as they enter a 2023 season where the biggest the biggest story is going to be whether or not they're going to be able to repeat. So on Monday, January 9th, Georgia beat TCU 65-7 to to win their second straight national championship. Um, they only had that one national championship in the modern era. Now all of a sudden they've got three and two in a row. On Saturday, January 14th, an incredibly celebratory moment that they can take this all in. They celebrate the championship in Athens. Later that night in the early hours of January 15th, 2.30 a.m. Eastern Time, what was at the time believed to be a single car crash led to the loss of life, the death of 24-year-old Chandler LaCroix, a member of the program's recruiting staff, offensive lineman Devin Willock, also, offensive lineman Warren McClendon and staffer Victoria Bowles sustained injuries. Then today, as we sit here more than a month, uh, a month and a half after that, we now find out that Jalen Carter uh, was present at the time of the crash. And additionally, he now faces uh, arrest warrants for two misdemeanors, reckless driving and racing, this coming from the athens Clark County Police Department. The ongoing investigation found that Chandler LaCroix, the driver of, of a 2021 Ford Expedition, and Jalen Carter, driver of a 2021 Jeep, Jeep Trackhawk, were operating their vehicles in a manner consistent with racing and shortly after leaving the downtown Athens area at about 2.30 a.m. Both vehicles switched lanes, drove in the center lane, drove in the opposite lanes of travel, overtook other motorists, and drove at high rates of speed in an apparent attempt to outdistance each other. Evidence indicated that shortly before the crash, the Expedition, which is what Chandler LaCroix was driving, was traveling at about 104 miles per hour. The toxicology report indi indicated that LaCroix's blood alcohol concentration was 0.197 at the time of the crash. Investigators determined that alcohol impairment, racing, reckless driving, and speed were significant contributing factors to the crash. What was already identified as a, 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 pro a reckless um, tragic event now has another player, and that is the other car that was racing the car driven by Chandler LaCroix, and that was driven by Jalen Carter, star defensive tackle for Georgia football, potential number one pick in the NFL draft. This news breaks an, an hour, 30 minutes before he was scheduled to meet with the media at the NFL Combine in Indianapolis. He has left the NFL combine. He will not be meeting with the media. He was not planning on working out. Um, He's actually in medical testing right now. Ooh. This, this has been an awful story, like from the jump. And now, and now we've got NFL draft implications. We've got you know, questions about um, you know, Georgia football and sort of like how you react to this. Because I had not heard one word about Jalen Carter's involvement in this crash in the time since January 15th. And now it seems that he was not only at the scene, that his messages to police at the time might have been a little back and forth. And now he, he played, if, as the police have found in their investigation, he was racing a car that crashed that led to the death 
of a 24-year-old woman and one of his teammates at the age of 20. This is awful, awful stuff. Yeah, a fresh statement from Georgia coach Kirby Smart. <clears throat> the charges announced today are deeply concerning, especially as we are still struggling to cope with the devastating loss of two beloved members of our community. We will continue to cooperate fully with the authorities while supporting these families and assessing what we can learn from this horrible tragedy. Did you say it was January 15th? Mm -hmm. That was the exact same day the shooting took place in Tuscaloosa with the Alabama basketball team. Oh! Exact same day. That's true. Um... It's awful. It's, you know, I, I don't know if you guys noticed this because the, the AJC, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, is the one who dropped this story. bombshell. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of like, because in the days after, like the 48 hours after the accident, and maybe it's just like the small circle that I follow on social media, but I saw some Georgia fans like mad at the AJC for digging around for details on the story. Like what they were doing before the crash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. why is that a big deal? Like, why are you guys bringing up, trying to dig up dirt on Georgia? I mean, this is why, <laughs> you know? Um, but what we were just uh, talking a minute before, I'm like, what do you think will happen? Like, what charges do you think he faces? What do you think he could possibly be looking at? Because we've seen players leading up into the draft facing legal issues before, some it's impacted greater, some it hasn't impacted at all. What uh, what do you think he's looking at here, just from reading the details? I mean, I it looks like the ones that that the arrest warrants are for are reckless driving and racing, which I think are are misdemeanors, right? They are correct. Um, now in Georgia, forty dash six dash three nine three, like you could be charged with vehicular homicide if the way you operate the vehicle causes the death of another person. Now, if that is in a reckless manner, then that would be a felony, but he's not charged with that, right? I'm just saying like, if their investigation finds more right now, what they put in, in the, in, in the warrant here, right. Was uh, that the cars were in excess of hundred miles an hour. Uh, it was going 104 miles an hour uh, shortly before the crash. The AJC had reported that Carter gave inconsistent statements to the police, uh, first saying that he was more than a mile away uh, from the crash, later saying that he was close enough to see the taillights uh, at the crash scene. But uh, I don't believe he stuck around the crash scene, right? So that is potentially, uh, that may be a thing, but it also is potentially a, a hindrance to an investigation because the other driver had a blood alcohol of 0.197, which is more than double the legal limit in pretty much all states, I believe. And in, in Florida, it's it's 0.08. Same. Same. I mean, like, look, we don't know what Jalen Carter was doing before the crash. If he had stuck around there, maybe we would have known, right? We we don't we don't know. Uh, we don't know where he's coming from. Meaning, was he at the same club that the other folks? who were racing allegedly uh, were at, what were they doing at the club? Right. W was he operating under the influence? We don't know. Right. He certainly was, was in concert racing according, you know, to, to these charges. Uh, but look, if I'm an NFL team, I want to know, is this guy Henry Ruggs? Right. Cause that's a major concern. You know, are, were you racing? Were you drinking? There's potentially a lot of bad here. The only thing he's actually charged with right now are two misdemeanors. We'll see if more comes to that. Well, they can easily go look at cameras from the strip club and wherever else they were and see if he was, you know, the, drinking, guess, hanging out <clears throat> in the same places, right? They could. My guess is, and this is, again, just an absolute guess, but based on timing of things, I don't think you're going to see them pursue more simply because the story came out before the arrest warrants ever did. Had this had the Atlanta Journal Constitution not broken the story, do these arrest warrants ever get issued? You think so? Man, I, I I don't know enough. Like Athens is not a huge town, but it's not. I'm not necessarily. 
I mean, are we are we going there thinking like they would have never charged him had the AJC not dug around? I don't know. It could be they were still gathering evidence because sometimes this stuff does take a lot of time. And like you yeah. said, he didn't stick around on the scene. So they, they, they might be having to be thorough about it. But it is somewhat strange that the story breaks and then an hour later there are warrants issued. Like, is think... that just a deal with the PR backlash of there not being warrants out? Or is it just like they got sped up because it's like, well, crap, now we have to get them out? Mm. I, I don't know. Uh, well, the, hold on. They, they had to at least have done the work to prepare the warrants. But, like, Bud, you, you, come on, lawyer. Yeah. Help me out here. No, <laughs> they, they definitely would. It, also. Because um, you got to get a, a judge or a, somebody important to be able to sign off on these things? Pro probably not for misdemeanor warrants, no. Okay. Um, so, and not in Georgia. I, I'm not licensed to practice law in Georgia. But so I, I don't know. And I, I don't do criminal law anyway. Uh, just disclaimers, disclaimers. Look, I think if you're the DA's office, one of the things you would worry about here a little bit is if we think the AJC has this, does CBS have it? Does Yahoo have it? Does ESPN have it? When Jalen Carter gets up on the stage to do interviews, is he is somebody going to ask him about this? And then we look really bad because we didn't charge him, to Tom's point. Like maybe that, maybe it's not that he wouldn't have been charged, but the, the timing of the combat interview stuff comes out today. What does George Kirby Smart issued that statement? I appreciate you bringing that up here as it just drops live. What how, what does Georgia football to you? Does this does this resonate in any any larger way? How does it make you feel? I mean, I don't know if what happened can be. It's God, this is so. It, it's not like a serious it to me it's a serious thing that happened but i don't know if this is like an like endemic to the program they were right. out celebrating their national title they were all kids in their early to mid 20s what did we do when we were celebrating at that age we drank now a lot of us were smart enough not to go driving and racing afterwards but it's i don't think we can look at this and see what happened and be like, oh, well, this is this is a Georgia football issue. I think it's an issue that happened to Georgia football players and Georgia football staffers. Uh, yeah, I, it's certainly a tragedy. Um, you know, from Georgia's standpoint, if I'm Georgia's attorneys, I don't love this set of facts. Correct. Right? School, school employee, partying with players, using a, a, a school rental car, 100 plus mile an hour crash death. That's not one that I love having to defend in the civil suit, which I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that will happen at some point. Um, I think it'd be different. I think we'd be reacting different if it happened December 15th before the game, you know, and we'd found out kind of like what's happened at Bama basketball, you know, that we found out and they're still playing, like if it had just gone along. And then these details came out after the fact. More along the lines with Tom, you know, it's not a great look um, for the program for sure. But they just won a national championship. Kirby's second. You know, it's just the harsh reality that that's what fans care about. That's what the school cares about. That's what's going to make them all the money. And, you know, most, most programs, you got 110 kids on a team, 85 scholarship players. There's going to be some that have some issues, you know, it's just kind of at, at any workplace. It's kind of how it goes. I mean, I'm sure we've had colleagues at CBS sports who have had issues with the law. Maybe they weren't plastered all over the news. Some of them were, I and mean, there was a, there was somebody from our company that got into a little trouble a few years ago. He's no longer with the company. You know, like it's just, it's part of being human, I guess. It's just, you don't want it to be unfolding on this stage like this after that moment. And now finding out issues where, it does appear, I don't know if it's fact, but it appears like the AJC did break this and then the arrest warrant was issued. It appears that way. Mm -hmm. And that's not a good look for anybody. I think, Kirby, I think Kirby Smart has an opportunity right now. As the grieving continues, there's also a chance to, to try to use this as a as a, as a a charge. I mean, you've got an opportunity to be a leader here. I mean, this is like a horrible horrible situation that has impacted your team and your program in a deep way i think if you just 
swallow it and bury it and don't try to learn from it, I think there's a missed opportunity. And Kirby Smart is one of the most handsomely paid uh, individuals in all of college football. And I would hope if I was the parent of a current Georgia football player that he would be using this as a way to try and help everybody grow so that these mistakes are not made again. Because these stories, man, they like they they truly haunt me because the the line between young and dumb and young and dead can be very, very thin. And I just I think about times that now seem like close calls, like from my own life. I think about my two sons and the fact that they're going to be young and dumb one day. And so I don't have anything that I it will always be tied to this championship, unfortunately, especially as the accident happened the night of the championship celebration. But my strongest feeling about Georgia and culture and Kirby and anything like that is that I would hope if I was the parent of a player on Georgia's football team, that this is used as a way to help everybody grow to make sure that this thing doesn't happen again. Because just ignoring it and trying to treat this like clutter, we're going to put it on the outside, we're just going to stay focused, keep moving, that to me is uh, that, that to me is really missing a chance to make sure that this does, doesn't happen again. You know, something I, I – don't talk to my sons about right now because they're three and one, but somebody told me one time you, you, you can make a lot of little mistakes, right? But like there are certain mistakes that can really screw up your life and your career and, and other, other people's stuff. And I'm not trying to like, you know, pass judgment. Everybody on, on the show would agree that, you know, racing or drunk racing is, you know, even worse are, are just not things you should do. If I'm Kirby smart, I am concerned internally. Was this the first time that this was happening or was this the first time that it ended in this fashion? And I think I, I'm going to have a talk with my team about racing, particularly after rugs, after this, and like these guys, and you know, young rock stars, young rap stars, they get really nice cars. If you're kind of if you're making the kind of money now, because wh while the one was university lease for an expedition, that's not really the, the something I'd, I'd really feel like I want to go racing in. 2021 Jeep Trackhawk, that that's a hundred thousand dollar used car. I just pulled it up on Auto Trader. That, that's what Jalen Carter was driving. That thing's got some serious horsepower. You could probably race in that pretty good. And these guys get these nice cars. If I'm Kirby, I'm, I'm having a talk. Like, guys, we are zero tolerance for racing. Because it it just, like, cars in general bring scrutiny. You have to register them with the government. They're easily searched, right? Like, cars lead to arrests for, for drugs and guns if you happen to be carrying those, right? Like, they're just generally a bad thing to do bad things in cars. And so if I'm Kirby, I'm like, guys, uh, we are not racing, not not in 2023 where we can you know, Uber Lyft, but obviously like don't DUI, don't drink and drive, but do not race. Like that's really not okay. And it's, uh, I think you bring up a great point because, you know, athletes are competitive, you know, you get out there and you think you're goofing around and, you know, I think we've all done it. I mean, I don't I was roommates with Jason Seahorn and we had one parking garage when I was on the giants. We, we shared a townhouse and there was one covered spot. And so we'd race home to see who got to park our car inside. Like that was a, it's kind of a thing. And we'd be going a hundred miles on the Jersey turnpike to get home to our, you know, townhouse to just because we wanted to see where it parked. never did it drunk, but still it doesn't make it any better. And you get young and dumb. I mean, Chip said it great, you know, said, it, said it perfectly, but I think you bring up a great point. Like, the also it's definitely not the first time because five days ago uh jamal dumas johnson was arrested georgia's stud linebacker was arrested for reckless driving and racing so like if i'm kirby that's what i'm worried about i'm like okay yeah. all of our dudes on this roster have serious nil value most of them are getting paid something through nil they can spend that money on really nice cars they're 20 years old this is i'm not saying georgia has a racing problem like systemically but they clearly have had a couple incidents with it within the last six weeks mm. all right one more <sighs> all right one more story then we're gonna hit a break and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk ball moving this down the line the tennessee uh case currently we don't have any ncaa punishment that is handed out for former tennessee head coach jeremy pruitt we don't have any program-wide head co uh, punishments from the NCAA. However, four staff members 
from Jeremy Pruitt's uh, Tennessee football staff, which Sports Illustrated has identified as linebackers coach Brian Niedermeyer, uh, linebackers coach Shelton Felton, the director of player personnel Drew Hughes, and student assistant Michael Magnus have acknowledged level one violations involving cash payments, impermissible recruiting contacts during the COVID-19 dead period, and inducements. In total, Tennessee has been accused of 18 level one violations, level one, of course, being the most serious. That's going to lead to uh, some show. None of the four individuals uh, who agreed to all of them got show cause uh, penalties. None of them are involved in college coaching. Again, a show cause penalty means that for you to get a job in college football, the university will basically have to go to bat for you to the NCAA. It the most notable one I think that we can think of recently. Remember Chip Kelly got a show cause for Oregon's NCAA troubles. He was in the NFL. The show cause expired. Now he's back in UCLA. The show cause would need to expire for these four individuals to come back. Jeremy Pruitt, as I mentioned, uh, no punishment for him yet. Is the fact that this appears to be wrapping up, does that make you think that we will see a final resolution to Tennessee's NCAA issues soon? I mean, look, the fact that these four guys cut deals and still got show causes does not make me think that Jeremy Pruitt's going to dodge a show cause. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, I don't think it's going to really impact Tennessee all that much long term. I think it's probably going to impact the, the coaches more. But this this case did arise under the, the sort of the new guidelines where the head coach is – like they impute the responsibility for the assistant actions to the head coach. So – yeah, uh, I I think it's fair to assume that Jeremy Pruitt is going to get a penalty that will prevent him from being able to be the defensive coordinator at Alabama, for example, and that the the potential of that had to have been part of the discussion when Nick Saban was doing his defensive coordinator search. Should Tennessee get a death penalty? Ooh. <laughs> Should the 2022 season be stricken from the record books? Should all the wins be vacated? <laughs> Dig Should... up the goalpost from the river. Yeah. Get yeah. out of there. That's what you got to do. Fraudulent goalpost rivering. Um, yeah, it's I, I think I, I think you're right in that Jeremy Pruitt not being the defensive coordinator at Alabama probably has something to do with this. Think that good odds there. I do think there could be more coming. I don't think whatever comes is going to be detrimental to the Tennessee football program. I don't I expect did. the postseason ban. I do not yeah. expect that the current Tennessee volunteers will be punished. And one thing that we have seen from the NCAA, thanks to a lot of public pressure, in my opinion, is that the most ridiculous thing has been punishments for a current team for the violations from something that happened two, three, four years ago. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And it does seem like the NCAA has moved away from creating those kinds of scenarios. Mm -hmm. it's i mean it's kind of laughable that's why i haven't even like done too much research on this it happened the year before the year before the rules changed like if we were still under the old formula and no nil and players weren't signing multi-million deals and we were seeing them just in a totally different light then i think we'd all be like "Ooh, what's tennessee looking at I'm like everybody's kind of realized the NCAA can't really do anything. And are you really going to go back and try to lay the hammer down after the fact since everything has changed? Maybe they try to make Jeremy Pruitt a fall guy just so they look like they feel like they're doing something. But I don't think anything's going to happen to Tennessee football specifically. I, I mean, you know, nobody got a minor slap on the wrist. Nobody got any tattoos. So it's really not that big of a deal. All right. <laughs> Agree with everything you guys have just said, with one exception. It's legal for players to get money now through NIL. And I'm not trying to carry the NCAA's water. I, I definitely think they're kind of a critical organization. NCAA bub over here. Here he comes. Look, here he I'm, comes. I'm relatively sure, okay, that like Nick Saban and Kirby Smart are not giving $60,000 via themselves or their wife or other close buddies to players. But they were just smarter about it. You're yes, also not. That's what right. I'm saying. Yes. Right. Like <laughs> if, if you're this sloppy, you're probably gonna get popped. I'm like, I I, I mean you think you might you tell me they learned why... it from somewhere, which okay, then that's maybe maybe I'm wrong about the other guys, but I, I just kind of feel like 
other schools are not this sloppy with this if, if it went down as alleged. <laughs> Agreed on that. Like, yeah, yeah. But, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, again, it's like they were really stupid how they went about it, and it looks awful. But again, it kind of goes back to this would be such a bombshell if everything else wasn't unfolding, but it has. And I don't think anybody cares. Yeah. Just- <laughs> you know, like it used to be like, I think a lot of people would have cared and been irate. Like, they, and, pro- and the death penalty would have been brought up. But the fact that we're in this new era, it's like nobody even gives it a second thought. Yeah, this is. I'm uh, just thinking of Nick Saban yelling at him, being like, I don't have Miss Terry handing out envelopes of cash. All right. That's not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> um, and I'm not oh, going to tell hey, you. <laughs> on, on the car, on the Carter thing, uh, I, I do want to give a shout out to the AJC here. Uh, we had asked, like, was Carter at, at the strip club too? Uh, yes. Several players, including Carter, capped the evening at Toppers International Show Bar, a strip club in downtown Athens, accompanied by members of the football team's recruiting staff. The group left the club at 2.30. Surveillance video obtained by the AJC shows. Uh, many of them planned to meet at a Waffle House about three miles away. And then they they have them on video. But don't uh, you think li- more importantly is was he drinking at the strip club? Yes, but I, I, I know we had asked the question, like, yeah, wh- where did they meet up? Where were they leaving? Like, I, I didn't want to assume things, but yeah. Um, um so yeah that's uh if if somebody uh triple two just jumped in the chat talk jalen carter we we just bounce back to the beginning of the show we we got you right there and uh bud thank you for the follow-up all right coming up on the other side we're turning our attention to ball to the 2023 season to the teams that we think could be poised for a turnaround year next War has descended upon this place. Mark my words, this fight ain't over. Where I'm going is dangerous. Let's look death in the eye then, shall we? What happened? That happened. 1923. All episodes now streaming exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Back here guys, on what? Yes. You guys watch 1923 yet? Not yet. I'm gonna put it on the iPad for my travel coming up Thursday tomorrow to go to the combine. I'm gonna try to get oh my into gosh, it. That's right. I, I keep falling asleep because I'll put it on late and it's a little slow that first episode. But like, if I'm forced to watch it on a plane, I'll I'll, I'll fire it up. That's actually a great line in the sand. Things that I would watch on a plane versus things that I would watch in the comfort of my own home. It's definitely a bucket for that. And if it draws um, me in, then I'll go at home. I'll finish it at home. I'll get into right. it on the plane. Uh, back here on the Cover 3 podcast, we're going to look for potential candidates for big turnaround seasons. In the 2022 season, there were six teams who saw improvements of seven wins or more. Tulane, 10-win improvement, 2-10 and 10 to 12-2. and two. TCU, 8-win improvement, 5-7 and seven to 13-2. and two. Washington, Seven wins, four and eight to eleven and two. Troy, seven wins, five and seven to twelve and two. USC, seven wins, four and eight to eleven and three. Ohio, seven wins, three and nine to ten and four. Why does that stand out to me? Because of those six teams that saw massive turnarounds, four of them were new hires: TCU, Washington, Troy, and USC. There was a second-year coach who built an absolute wagon. Shout out to Ohio and a team that was displaced by Hurricane Ida in Tulane. Uh, The lows of 2021 also might have been lower due to the 2020 COVID season in the Pac-12 and the MAC that would have impacted how bad things got for uh, a Washington, a USC, and Ohio. Uh, And Tulane, though, probably cresting a little bit more for this time. Beginning of the conversation I saw in the chat, there was like, what marks a turnaround? And for our purposes, we looked at, you know, Either a win improvement of, you know, four wins somewhere around there, close to a handful, or uh, what, I, what I call jumping up in weight class. Like, are you, are you in the bottom of the conference and now you're in a bowl game? Or are you around 500, now you're a conference title contender? Those would mark turnarounds. Those do not require seven win improvements. But I did want to begin with that as the backdrop. Is there a team that could see a seven win improvement in 2023? Well, the pool's pretty limited. It <laughs> when, when you go with the um, I think 
we've got on the notes Colorado and Dion is somebody that you have to kind of keep an eye on for there. I think that's an obvious choice based on just the talent infusion on that roster and playing in a Pac-12 where I do think particularly at the bottom of that conference, there's a there's a lot of teams you could, you know, beat up on if you're Colorado and you suddenly improve your talent. So you win a couple other games elsewhere, bang, big improvement. Elsewhere, I didn't include this team on my list, but I do think it's just in the realm of possibility, even if I don't think it's going to happen and everything that's happened there this offseason suggests it will not. But just based on things that they've done before, Northwestern can go from 1-11 to 8-4. and four. That's that's what we're looking at here. I mean, North Northwestern could go eight and four. That is not unfamiliar territory for mm-hmm. Pat Fitzgerald's program to be able to get up there. So haven't they had like that trend where they're up, down, up, down? Yeah, but there there've been a couple downs in a row now. And then just you look at like the one thing about Northwestern and Pat Fitzgerald's tenure is like the coaching turnover has been minimal. Been a lot of coaching turnover this offseason on that staff. The only thing I wonder about them, because I thought, you know, Stanford would fit this category too. And I don't know Northwestern's policy, but Stanford is not budging on the transfer portal policy, academic restrictions. Like, and in this era, I think it's only going to get more challenging to stay competitive with all the schools that are. Oh, You're muted. Bub's rivalry with the mute button. Bub. I'm muted. Back there again. we go. Sorry. I, I, I sneezed. <laughs> um, yeah. Also, like, Northwestern's last up year in this whole up cycle, down cycle thing was the COVID year, which mm-hmm. I'm not saying it doesn't count, but it does make me a little more dubious of all the things that were going on, you know, in that cycle. Um, what about the Colorado was one in 11 last year, one in eight in the Pac 12. Can Deion Sanders turn in an eight win season? He could, but I wouldn't bet on it. Yeah. Yeah. Eight wins, including a bowl game, including is a bowl game, yeah, like the very upper range, I think, of what you could do. Yeah, like I, I think if we're looking at Colorado as going from one win to a bowl game, there's a very realistic shot at that because, as I say, like you look at the Pac-12 and USC, Washington, Oregon, Utah, UCLA, and Oregon State, maybe not as good, but they're all probably going to be the top of that conference or at least the better teams. But there was always kind of like a gap between that top half of the league last year and everybody else. Whereas if you're Colorado and then you improve, Arizona State's kind of hit a reset button with Kenny Dillingham coming in in the first year. Cal is, I don't know what Cal is anymore. Arizona, Jed Fish is going into year three. Maybe they take the step forward. Wazoo, they're still interesting. That you know They'll probably be competing for a bowl spot again. But there's just a lot of teams in that area where if Colorado's good enough and in- increases its talent level, you feel like it can win those games, whereas it didn't have a chance to win any games last year. Yeah, I think Colorado is going to be favored in over Colorado State, most likely. They could, probably at home against Stanford, I think. And yeah. then there are a couple games that they could be favored in, although right now I probably would not have them favored in. Like if Washington State, if the floor completely collapses, I could see them favored in that game. Arizona in Boulder, potentially, maybe at Arizona State if if the Wildcats or if the Sun Devils rebuild is, is really that bad. But you would have to... to sweep all the, the potential coin flip games, pull two more upsets, and then also win your bowl game for that to happen, right? So that seems really unlikely that they're going to do that. I thought it just, it seemed unlikely that we had all those six teams have a seven plus win turnaround last season. Yeah. And all the prep for this, I was like, I don't see anybody doing it with like legitimately Colorado being a factor is mostly impacted by the fact that they only had one win last year. We're, we're kind of due for this to happen in the Mac. It used to happen like every single year and it, it didn't happen this past year. Right. So okay. we're kind of due there. The Mac doesn't count. Right. No, the Mac does. I said, Ohio, Ohio jumped from uh, the Ohio Bobcats last year, jumped from three and nine to 10 and four. Oh, shoot. Sorry. I, I So they got, uh, yeah, I understand. Like you, you are not a fan of the wagon and that's okay. Those are those of us who, who support the wagon and no have, check the tape. I made the I made the YouTube <laughs> short on Curtis Rourke. Um hey, so Croy was the other one, right? They were a two win team that went all the way to twelve and two, right? Who? Yeah. Troy was a massive turnaround. Troy was five and seven to twelve and two. That yeah. was one that I think you could see coming somewhat because they had a culture disaster 
inside that program that they fixed by firing their head coach. And then they, on top of that, they made a pretty good head coaching hire in John Summerall. Well, yeah, so, that's like TCU, um, eight win improvement, first year coach, great hire. Washington, seven win improvement, uh, first year coach, great hire. Troy and culture, one- culture there too, right? I think guys that tuned yeah. out Gary Patterson, they absolutely mm-hmm. were not happy with Jimmy Lake. And they had checked out on Clay Helton too, where yeah. we also mm-hmm. saw a big seven win improvement. I I use those only to set the stage that I definitely use that to try to like search out something. Is Colorado State gonna have a big improvement? I've got them on my list as possibilities. Because they went three and nine last year, and Jay Norvell took over a like bad, bad, a bad situation, situation. Yeah. in the wake of Steve Adazio. And we, I, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be good for business for us to spend uh, eight minutes on Colorado State. But I'm glad that you had them down on your list because when I was looking at those teams that didn't win many games last year, and I was starting to think about like what it takes to, to turn over a roster, to turn over a culture, Colorado and Colorado state, as you mentioned, bud, play against each other uh, in the non-con, the rest of Colorado's non-con being TCU and Nebraska. All right. What about some teams that I think were, you know, just sort of popular uh, potential candidates here, uh, just notable teams that missed a bowl game. So clearly in my eyes, the expectation is that there is going to be a turnaround, a significant turnaround, that you are not going to be missing a bowl game or flirting with 500. Let's begin with the Texas A&M Aggies. Five and seven overall, two and six in SEC play. What is your level of confidence that Texas A&M is going to see uh, a big turnaround year in 23? Like eight and four? Five and seven to eight and four does not feel like a big turnaround to me. I think that five and seven to nine and three, ten and two is what we're talking about. That would make make for what I would call a big turnaround year. I'd like to hear what you guys think. I would say my chances of A and M going ten and two are eleven percent max. <laughs> You've got the infusion of Bobby Petrino as offensive coordinator, as we discussed in the assistant coaching carousel. Go check that out uh, if you haven't already. We've got a, a group, a talented group that included, as Bud, as you mentioned on that show, Evan Stewart at wide receiver, a quarterback in Connor Wegman who showed flashes near the end of the season. There is a potential that this Texas A&M offense will score <gasps> 30 points. What? In multiple games, maybe. But there is a potential that we see a team that has been, you know, defense first, not really explosive offensively, start to take some big steps forward offensively. I think we will see notable on-field improvement. I do not think we will see Texas A&M flirt with being a 10-win team in 2023. Yeah, I mean, Mm. they... Nine, I think, is the max. I think nine is the farthest I'd be willing to go. They could start 5-0. I was just looking at their schedule. That'd be a very Texas A&M thing to do. And then get yeah. crushed by Alabama. Like they'll right. go into the, they'll go into reality. the Alabama game and be like, "Oh, it's Jimbo. It's saving his A and M a contender for the playoff in the SEC." And then they'll lose like forty two to fifteen or something. Oh yeah, if they're five and zero, oh, they're definitely ranked two in the country. Right, right, yeah. That's a, it'll be a top five matchup, yeah. and I think it'll be more like forty two to twenty seven. You know, like yeah. they'll 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 mess around and not get totally worked, but then then it'll lead into going, uh, you know two and or th- three or four and three or something the rest of the schedule you, you guys laugh about this but th- this stuff means something to programs guys i mean mississippi state being number one in the first ever playoff poll is the biggest accomplishment that program's had since world war one so yeah. like like they, they they still tweet me about that like, what are you saying we've never done anything we were number one in, in september 8th in, in 2014 what <laughs> like, we, 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 we mock about september heisman but it's yeah. true. It is. It is a trivia. It, like you're at trivia night, the ball. Like who is the first team ever ranked number one in a college football playoff poll? Mississippi State. I love how the SEC teams get pre credit for playing your SEC schedule. Like if they if they kill their non conference, which is a cakewalk, which A and M's is not because they have to go to Miami. We're, we're, we'll mm-hmm. talk about Miami in a second here, but they get like double credit because you get credit for the schedule you're about to play, and then you get credit when you play it, mm-hmm. and you get credit for what Alabama and Georgia have done. The, the other trivia part of that that is not so good for Mississippi State is there are very few teams who are ranked number one in the first college football playoff release to miss the college football playoff. I think it's only two or three have ever done that. Mississippi State is one of them. Mm-hmm. So 
Congrats. You are a trivia answer also for your inability to convert at the same clip as all these other number one teams in the first rankings. All right. What about those Miami Hurricanes? Five and seven overall, three and five in the ACC. We have entirely rebooted. I mean, of the 10 um, on field coaching positions, I think we've got changes at six or seven. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot. I, I don't know if that, insp- that does not inspire confidence in me. However, Miami does have um, a, a lot of turnover in its neighborhood in the ACC. It does have some some wins on the schedule that I think that you can chalk up there. I can very easily see Miami making small improvements on its win total. Do you think that Miami can flirt with being that nine and three, ten and two type team in twenty twenty three? Similarly, I think I'd go to nine and three. Uh, and I had another ACC team in there, and that's one of the reasons I think you have to consider Miami because it is the ACC. Mm-hmm. Like, if they get things figured out, they've got more talent than most of the teams they're going to play against. <clears throat> yeah, they uh, Miami does draw both Florida State and Clemson from the old um, the old Atlantic. They also draw Louisville, who I think is probably a decent team that has a cakewalk schedule. Uh, and then they also have to play on the road at North Carolina and at NC State. Uh, Miami schedule to me is sneaky tough, but they're like if you're doing like floor ceiling ratings, their floor I think is still really low because there is some chance that the exodus of coaches down there indicates that there's real cultural problems. I don't know that to be the case, but I mean it, you have to consider the possibility. Their ceiling also remains really high because that roster still has a lot of talent on it. I think their offensive line almost certainly will be healthier than it was last year, as well as their quarterback position, unless Van Dyke gets hurt again, uh, and then the receivers as well. And they, they when, when Restrepo went down and George had the was he suspended to start the year, I think, and then also got dinged up as well. Uh, that that seemed to handicap their their ability to uh, you know put up points. I, I have a hard time seeing them be worse, and if they really click and win their close games, they, they could they could go ten and two. Sure. I mean, when we, when we look at fan or whatever uh, betting website out there puts up like the odds to win 10 games, they'll, they'll be one you have to take a look at, but I, I don't think it's super likely. There are a lot of questions about this Miami team. Cause like you said, but there's a low floor and there's a very high ceiling. So in those kind of situations, there's a lot of things you have to wonder, but the biggest question I have about the Miami hurricanes in 2023 is why are they playing on the road against temple? It's probably a two for one situation. Uh, some uh, of these some of these programs uh, have taken in, instead of just paying the, the the million and a half to to do a buy game, you know. And know, people are going to say this is a shot at Miami, but okay, sure, l- 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 it is a shot, a screenshot of what the attendance would look like if you paid Temple a million and a half dollars to come down to play Miami in in the September heat. They'd sell fifteen thousand tickets to it, maybe, and that that you, you'd lose money. You'd rather just go knock out the trip up there and not pay the million and a half, I guess, and, and do the two for one. Yeah, cause I was like, when I was doing, going through the research for the show and I'm sitting there like, but going through their schedules, I'm like, why the hell are they playing on the road against Temple? That makes, yeah, that makes sense though. That's the ACC thing. Remember last year in the yeah. first two weeks of the season and their record is not great. And so they schedule them and then they don't win them all like they're supposed to. Stupidity. Mm. It was actually part of the trade when they got Manny Diaz. Uh, oh yes no i no, no i'm that's not true <laughs> using that, that would be scary. hilarious temple like when you're when you're or trying to get rid of a traffic. contract yeah. yeah you gotta yeah and temple's like well we'll take ds but you gotta give us a home game too yeah. <laughs> manny go to that game i mean he, he's at penn state it's not that bad of a drive <laughs> happy a valley to drive. Billy. like like you've penn you state all over there weekend um all right what about the michigan state spartans five and seven last year three and six in the big 10 plus in big 10 play when you've got Michigan and Ohio State seemingly as two top four teams going into the year. Penn State as everyone's favorite dark horse lurking there in that five to ten range of your preseason rankings. I do not. I mean, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to like cut it off, but like where where is the room for Michigan State to jump up and have a big turnaround? Thinking the 95 mil was a bad deal. Mm. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of room for it. I mean, I, I think like in the last but I expect to be the last year of the division setup. Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State are still going to be good. I think Maryland is 
you know, we saw last year Maryland finished ahead of Michigan State in the division. I don't think they're going to be great, but I still think they're going to be pretty tough to deal with. So when I look at Michigan State and you look at their schedule, like their non-con is all at home. Central Michigan should be a win. Rich, Richmond should be a win. But Washington, you know, they lost to Washington last year. They could lose to Washington at home this year. They get Maryland. They have to go on the road for Iowa, for Minnesota, for Ohio State, and Indiana. It's like... I think they're going to get to a bowl, but I don't know if like seven and five, if there's really a whole lot of wiggle room past that for this team next year. If there is some optimism here, I'll be quick on this. Their road games include Rutgers, Indiana, and Minnesota, right? Like, and obviously Ohio State, but Minnesota has been a better program than Michigan State has most years. Sure. That's, that's fair. Um, But like, there are, are tougher places to play than a couple of those those venues that, that I just read off. So they do get some of their games that I don't consider coin flips, but maybe that their fans uh, who are already probably baking in more improvement than I'm baking in would consider coin flips or, or more winnable games. They're getting those in East Lansing. So I guess it's, it's possible. I, I don't see it. Um, Danny, you had mentioned before the show that you've got Georgia Tech five and seven overall, four and four in ACC play. Brent Key, you know, led to a big rejuvenation of energy. I like that as a potential uh, turnaround team. What do you like about the Yellow Jackets? So we talked about culture. I think you saw a team that fought so much harder uh, after the change. And you saw some results that were very up and down. But again, it was kind of looking for teams and teams in the ACC specifically that you could see that. And I do think continuity with most of the staff and system that's in place is going to help them as well. They're still playing two SEC teams on the schedule in Ole Miss and Georgia, which I kind of puts a a hard cap on what you can do probably. Because um, you're not going 8 no in ACC play. They do dodge Florida State. They dodge NC State, but they, they draw it's on the road. Miami, North Carolina, Clemson, and Louisville. So schedule's nuts. Now look, (laughs) down the stretch, I mean, there's some chance that UVA just is bad again, right? And there's a chance that Syracuse falls apart, and they they play those games late. So if you're trying to paint this narrative, like maybe. How about weight class? They go from bottle to uh, bottom weight class. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yes, agreed. Yeah, they uh, picking George. I don't think they're going nine or ten and three. Right, but Danny Cannell predicts the Yellow Jackets are going to go eleven and one this year. Um, Also, you you pointed out two teams in the American Athletic Conference, and I had a really hard time trying to handicap the American Athletic Conference and Conference USA, as both those leagues are are going to really see. Um, sort of an influx of new teams, totally reshake, reshaping the pecking order there. Uh, who are those two teams that you like right there and and what sort of stands out about them? So I think SMU is the obvious one, especially if you've been paying attention to what they did in the transfer portal and the recruiting rankings. Like they are spending. They've got this deal where everyone gets paid. What the results we saw last year, I do think they're going to continue to build on that. And then I also think, kind of like the ACC, anything's wide open. I think the void that's left behind is going to provide opportunity for teams that were right below UCF, Houston, Cincinnati. And I'd put I'd put SMU in that category as somebody who could step up and fill that void, and all of a sudden make a big jump to the top. What about Tulsa? Tulsa was me. I talked to Kevin Wilson. That might be one a little biased where I think he's a really good coach, and I think he could infuse some fresh life into that program. You can see that new coach turnaround year one again a team that's had some success in the conference and then all of a sudden you know you lose some of those powerhouses they could step in uh in that similar vein they did like, get a big break with with the quarterback braxton at tulsa he went in the portal and he came he back. came back he's yeah. got some juice to him yeah i like the smu call it's like they have in non-con they've got road games against oklahoma and then the rivalry game with tcu which i mean the tcu game might be a lot more winnable this year than it was last year but like when you get into their conference schedule, it's like that's the weird thing about looking at the new AAC. It's like I, <laughs> it seems like oh this looks easy, but then it's like wait everybody's AAC schedule might look easy this year because nobody has UCF, Cincinnati, or Houston on it. <laughs> but that's yeah. well, I was gonna, and I was gonna put I almost put FAU on this list because I, I, maybe it was a shot at Willie Taggart, but I just think that program was really poorly run while he was there, and it was a disaster. And Tom Herman's going to bring some instant, you know, credibility and structure and discipline to the program. 
But the fact that they're making the jump up had me concerned. That's why I kept them all. Yeah, I've got FAU on my list because for a lot of those similar reasons, like the jump up is going to be a problem. But just because like we mentioned at the very top, when it comes to the teams that we saw make the major leaps last year, it was all coaching changes and culture shifts. I thought maybe that could play a big role. And also the fact that like we had Connolly on what, two weeks ago at this point? at this point his returning production ratings FAU is pretty high as far as returning production is concerned so it's an experienced team with a new coach a new voice might see some special things for them last thing on SMU there uh, I, I like the timing of the schedule so obviously you you, you do have to play Oklahoma TCU though those are, are tough ball games on the road they're they're going to probably start you know two and two in the non-conference assuming you don't you don't drop the home game to La Tech but you know, Charlotte is a team that is going to have 40 or 50 new players on its roster. Uh, East Carolina had tremendous turnover. They may be good by the end of the year, but I would much rather play this edition of East Carolina early. And I'd, I want to play that Charlotte transfer team early. You know, if I got to go to Temple, I'd rather go in October than November as far as weather, I guess, if you're worried about the cold for, you know, for a bunch of kids from Dallas. Uh, and you get Tulsa at home. At Rice is certainly not intimidating. You get North Texas, could be plucky at home. I mean, at Memphis is your toughest conference game, I believe. Uh, and then you you end with Navy, and I'm not really sure what Navy will look like this year. But, I mean, the, the timing of this SMU schedule, I, I like quite a bit. That Oklahoma game, and that's going to be a stressful one for Brent Venables. Like, you, you're expected to win. You're going to be favored to win. And SMU, it's like their Super Bowl early. Mm. It'll be like 48-27, you know, but, yeah. but like closer within the first yeah. 20 minutes, you know. Yeah. Speaking of those Oklahoma Sooners, are the Sooners set for a big turnaround? Do we think that Auburn and Nebraska can benefit from new hires and more of our turnaround candidates? Next. Welcome to the Split River High Afterlife Support Group. Everyone calls me Maddie. How'd you die? Police are considering this a missing person investigation. We found a blood all over the boiler room. Oh, you were murdered. Welcome to the club. I need to know what happened. I found something. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast, continuing with our look at turnaround candidates for 2023. Uh, already run through Texas A&M, Miami, Michigan State. Talk a little FAU. Talk a little Georgia Tech, Tulsa, SMU. And so let's keep it going with a, a team that, but I know you and I both, oh, and Tom, all three of us, this, this is where our, our pre-show planning is good because I know that we're all passionate about this so we can leave some dedicated time. The Oklahoma Sooners did make a bowl game. They lost it to Florida State. They were 6-7 and seven in 2023, yet we have all identified the Sooners as a potential turnaround candidate. So what do we like about Oklahoma heading into next season that could have them set for, I to me, I, I listed them thinking that 10-2 and two is the expectation, that 11-1 and one is a real possibility, and I would not bet on 12-0. But I am not ruling it out either. I'm a big fan of the idea that that big jumps happen in year two with coaches. Now, in recent years, some of the COVID stuff I think has, has screwed up this timeline. But now we should be relatively back to normal. Nick Saban uh, played for the national or won the national title in his second. No, no, he, he that was the undefeated year, right? Where, where they lost to Florida in 08. Yeah, because Flor yeah. that was Florida's last year. But at least he had probably the second best team in the country that year. They, they were undefeated, lost the SC title game. Urban Meyer won in his second year at Florida, and I think also his second year at Ohio State. That is or, correct. Or went undefeated. No, um, he went un I think he went undefeated year one, but they were ineligible for the postseason, and then they won the national title. Uh, they took an L in the regular season. Remember, entered as the Javon four Tech. seed, uh, jumping over Baylor and TCU to make the playoff. Kirby Smart played for the national title in year two, lo losing on the two a play. I think it was. Does that sound right? Um, so, was that was it the two game? It might have been. I can't remember. I uh, you might have one more year. Like, but it's his first year was either fifteen or sixteen. The title runner up being the runner up was in seventeen. He definitely had a crazy like jump in in, in year two, From like so, six and six to right. you know be competing for the uh, conference title. 
So I, I'm a believer in, in the year two thing. Uh, still, if you're a really good coach, we'll probably know it in year two if, if some of the dominoes can, can line up for you to fall. Now, I have some questions about Oklahoma. They do lose both their offensive tackles to the draft, uh, and both are expected to be you know decent draft picks, which is concerning. That's it's always a concern of mine. But you know, I think there are some things in terms of defensive improvement you can look for from this team. Getting Dylan Gabriel back, keeping Jeff Levy on the staff are, are also positives to me in this category. I think the receivers could take a step forward. We talked about that on the Monday show, and the schedule is fairly manageable, right? Uh, Arkansas, SMU in the non-conference, and there's one more that I'm probably missing here. You get TCU at home. You got to go to BYU, which is tough. West Virginia at home. I don't know what to make of Oklahoma State and Kansas right now. Red River will be tough. You got to you get Iowa State at home if you think they'll be plucky. Cincinnati loses a lot, and they get them early in the first year of Satterfield. So, so I could see 12 no. Yeah, I've, I'm a massive hypocrite in terms of uh, citing this statistic and then also trying to explain it away with intangible variables and vibes. But Oklahoma went 0 and 5 in one score games. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that. It ain't that far from this team winning a whole lot more games. Now, again, as I've like, as I criticize Texas and Steve Sarkeesian, it's like, well, why do you keep coming up short, huh? You know, is it a reflection of your coaching staff? Is it a re reflection of all these other things? The, the the math nerds out there will tell me that that is where you I'd like turnover luck. You know, bad luck in one score games. The game, the ball is shaped funny. There are strange bounces. There are unique calls. It is unlikely that Oklahoma is going to go zero and five in one score games. You throw in the return of the quarterback, a little bit of continuity, um, what I'm expecting out of the offense, as Bud just mentioned. And I was like, this is all of the recipe for Oklahoma to be able to make a big jump, probably playing for the conference title uh, on the first Saturday in December. Also, they should not be playing five one-score games against the schedule. If they make a yeah. big jump, they should be playing two or three one-score games, and every other game on the schedule should be a, a, a two or three-score win. I mean, let's be real. Like we've always been a big Oklahoma podcast. We've never had anything negative to say about Oklahoma, so it's no surprise that we have them on our list. But I, for me, honest, there's a ton of good reasons that we could go in like minute detail on. But the biggest reason for me why I expect Oklahoma to be a turnaround team is because Oklahoma's good, and it has been good. Like when we talk about the other teams, we've talked about like Texas A&M, Miami. These are programs that it's like every year. It's like, is this is the year? where they're going to, you know, restore themselves and be good again. Like Oklahoma was very good for a long time and had a down year. So for me, just based on history, last year is far more likely to prove to be an outlier than just a new trend. Now, that doesn't mean it can't be because we've seen a coaching change and sometimes you see stuff like that happen. But just based on what Oklahoma has been, a team that's been to the college football playoff multiple times, won a bunch of big 12 titles, I don't think it's crazy to think that they can go from six and seven to 10 and two, 11 and one, 12 and zero, just because they've done it many times already. I agree. You're getting, you're not asking them to take a leap where they haven't been. We're asking them to get back to their five year back. average. Yeah. Go yeah. back to you. Um, all right. What about with some first year coaches since, since we've got uh, Oklahoma, why not mention them too? Matt rule at Nebraska, Nebraska went four and eight overall three and six in the big 10. What is the level of confidence that Matt Rule is going to be able to get Nebraska? Bowl team does not feel like a big turnaround. I think that for us to call this a big turnaround, we're talking eight, eight and four, right? I don't know. I feel like Nebraska fans would feel like a bowl game right now is a big turnaround because it's been a while since they've been to a bowl game. Um, I think that the one thing we know about Nebraska for sure is that it's a coaching upgrade because the coaching of that team the last few years has been just on game day. You watch it, and there's just a whole lot of what were they doing. But the questions are, you still it's still hard to buy in because of what this program has been in recent years. So it's like you, you, you kind of get burned so many times that you take a very cautious approach to what they do. And you look at the schedule, like they start the year with two road games against Minnesota and Colorado. Like they could theoretically be 0-2 before they play their first home game against Northern Illinois. They get Michigan from the East. They have a road game against Michigan State. They get Maryland. So the draw isn't terrible, but it could have been better inside the division. They're on the road against Illinois. They're on the road against Wisconsin. I mentioned the Minnesota road game. Like, 
I think this is a team that could get to a bowl game. And if I'm going into 2023 as a Nebraska fan, that is my primary goal. If I'm Matt Rule, that's I'm not saying it's my primary goal, but my primary goal is let's get to a bowl game. Let's build some positive momentum. I don't think there's a major turnaround coming in year one. No Michigan, no Penn State on the schedule. Uh, no, they got Michigan. Or excuse me, excuse me, uh, no Ohio State, no Penn State. Mm-hmm. Apologies. Um, look, we went through Troy, Washington, a couple others where we said, all right, there was an obvious cultural problem that asking the head coach fixed at these programs. Is it really that unlikely that we could be sitting here in December of 24 saying, yeah, getting Scott Frost out and, and getting a competent coach in there uh, really solved a lot of this and, and that Nebraska improves and gets the right bounces on the way to nine and three? I, I think it's possible, right? Like that's within my range of possibilities, not likelihoods, but it's possible that that could happen. Well, to to connect this to Auburn, where I think that getting Brian Harson out yeah, and, you know, keeping Cadillac and bringing in Q freeze and the work that they've done in the transfer portal where they've just gone to get, I don't know, like all of the offensive linemen. Like we're just going to come in and have four new starters on the offensive line and we're going to run the dang ball. And um, you know, we, we, we're, you got one of the, uh, got a great running back in the portal. Like is the, maybe pers- a quarterback in the portal in the, the second window. Maybe possibly who wins that Georgia job. You think all those kids are going to stick around, even the losers? I don't know. So my question was, before we jump into Auburn, for Nebraska, Sorry. what's the personnel? Like, what is it? Because last, last year of Scott Frost, he went heavy portal. He had like 20, what, I think it was, if you include the freshman class, like he was up there with an Ole Miss where you were dealing with like more than 30 players who were just brand new to the program between freshmen and transfers. And that he had in terms of first year contributors who were new to the program, they were all over the two deep. It seemed very much to me from a roster building perspective, like Scott Frost knew he was on the hot seat. He was just going to do anything he could to try to plug and play, figure it all out. Very much a mis- mis- mishmash of, uh, of players on the depth chart. So when you've got that, it doesn't seem like we've got a lot of personnel continuity. What is Matt rule working with? Because I agree there's undoubtedly a, um, coaching upgrade but what about the level of roster talent so they got jeff sims to come out of the portal from from georgia tech uh they took a swing on eric gilbert now look i don't know how we say this there's not a higher floor lower ceiling player in the country eric gilbert is probably the best tight end recruit any of us have ever seen if he gets right off the field on the field and Nebraska can get a productive year out of him, he's going to tear people up. Like that, that dude is not normal. I mean, like he very much, there are occasionally some guys that don't do a damn thing in college for various reasons. And then all of a sudden become good NFL players. Like that's a guy, if I'm an NFL team, I, I, I'm still trying to sign as soon as he's eligible, just because the, the body type and the athleticism is just that far above and beyond what everybody else on the planet earth has. So I don't know, like maybe, maybe Eric Gilbert hitting helps them out. I, I am down on Nebraska's defensive transfer class relative to what some of the ratings have out there, including where I work, just personal opinion. I mean, it's obviously, you know, we all different opinions on this stuff, but I do like what they've done on offense. I I think they'll be able to score some points. Yeah. I mean, and too, like the Big Ten West is not going to be that much different than it was last year. Whereas when you look at the vision, like I know I mentioned Northwestern earlier in the show, I still think it's pretty solid that they'll probably be the last place team in the division. Purdue could have a rough transition with a new first year coach after winning the division last year, but they could also still be a very good team. So it's like the other six teams in that division. I don't know that anyone there is any that much better than the rest of the division where you can say, oh, they're going to pull away. So if Nebraska gets better coaching and like this is a team like we, a couple years ago was in a lot of close games and blew them and did stupid things. If they're still able to stay in close games and have better game day coaching and you know better leadership, it's not out of line to think that they will win more games. It's just if I'm a Nebraska fan, like I said earlier, tempering expectations just so I don't set myself up too high. All sure. right. So what what about those? Uh, and by the way, the great call and another one score game like Nebraska, even with horrendous coaching and everything else going on around the program, that still, program beat itself so many times the last few years. Just no other way to put it. Auburn was five and seven overall, two and six in SEC play. Hugh Freeze comes in. 
Life's difficult. Schedule's tough. Do you see? Do you see Auburn at like to me nine and three would be the remarkable turnaround. Nine and three would be like wow. Hugh Freeze potential like coach of the SEC coach of the year type discussion. Do you see? Uh, do you see five and seven to nine and three? I don't think it's crazy because I think like this is a team that has talent on the roster and you look at the rest of the SEC West, I expect Mississippi State will be worse this year. I expect Arkansas will be worse this year. That leaves some wiggle room. Of course, as we already mentioned, we think Texas A&M will probably improve. So how much of that can Auburn take advantage of? How much of their schedule can they take advantage of? Because the non-con, UMass at Cal Samford. Win. And New Mexico Win. State. Win. And New Mexico State. So you're four and zero oh there. So the question is, can you go five and three in a conference schedule? Like the the opener against Texas A and I'm on the road, that might make the entire season for them because if they lose that game, it's followed by Georgia and at LSU. So they're suddenly they're looking at a possibility of being zero and three in the SEC. And if that happens, it's easy to think things could just go the wrong direction. But if they win that road game at Kyle Field, it could really put them in a right frame of mind to go in and do something good. I, I would pay uh, a premium when the win total stuff comes out to be able to get the push protection of eight and four because I, I think eight and four – now, granted, it won't come out as eight. I, I think they'll make it like a seven. Um, I guess spoiler on, on how I would lean on that. But nine and three, eight and four, there's a pretty big delta there because that means that you have to pull a win out of at A&M, at LSU – Georgia Bama, which is possible. But if you only win one of those games, then you have to sweep your other SEC games. And they are very fortunate this year. Their road games include Vanderbilt and Arkansas, right? That, you know, disrespect to those teams, but those are not the top teams in the conference. You get both old, you get both Mississippi's at home. I, mean, I could see them sweeping that and 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 go that sweep in the non-con but that gets you to eight and four and you still got to win one more game i don't know it, they could do it yeah, it's just like, yeah, they, I, I they think they start can. they could start zero and three in the sec and be four and three in the sec by the time the iron bowl rolls around for sure and and it is an odd year right mm -hmm. i tell you what nine and three in year one with an iron bowl win would be one Heck of a start to the Hugh Freeze era. Mm -hmm. I, as I power rank um, the SEC West in my mind at this time on March 1st, I see them solidly fourth. I I think that they I put them ahead of both Mississippi's and Arkansas. And the fact that you throw Vanderbilt in there as their rotating opponent from the East. Yeah, they can, they can get to nine and three. Eight and four seems more realistic. But of all the t teams here, Auburn's the one where I do feel like you've got a pretty good starting point and uh, and certainly a big time upgrade when we're looking for the year one coaches who have really flipped uh, from kind of a toxic atmosphere. I think that this is a, a good place for us potentially to uh, to find that given how it was two straight seasons of Brian Harson stuff uh, all around this program. All right, let's uh, man. We've already uh, did, we lost Bud. Mm -hmm. Bud has got a meeting to go to. So it's just you and me now. A Let's meeting? talk soccer. <laughs> All right, who else is on your uh, your list for for potential uh, turnaround candidates? I mean, it's a team I'm honest to God surprised that I'm the only one who put it on their turnaround candidate list because it has been the turnaround candidate for going on like 15 years now, and I only put it on just based out of habit, not really 100% based out of confidence. But Texas, like it is a incredibly talented team playing in the big 12 in which, you know, there's some new look members of the conference, but like if Quinn Ewers takes a step forward or if he doesn't, and he's replaced by Arch Manning, who is turns out to be the real deal. Like this is a team that should be better than it has been. But like I said, Texas is a team that should be better than it has been most years since 2006. Yeah. The, uh, the team that consistently has graded out from the power ratings perspective as one of the top teams in the entire country. Uh, the one score game stat, they went two and five in one score games last year. So the the margins for flipping this are very, very close, uh, though pretty difficult. I tell you what, so it, 
I see Texas. They do have to play Alabama. Mm -hmm. And that game is going to be in Tuscaloosa. Mm -hmm. I've got that as a loss. Yeah. I mean, but here's the thing. I have it as a loss as well. If you were to look at Alabama's schedule and power rank the opponents by their ability to beat Alabama, how high would Texas be? Because let's not forget how close Texas came to beating Alabama last, last year. year. 11 and one. It's not out of the range of possibility. Like Oklahoma will be at a neutral site. Alabama. I do think they lose on the road, but you look at the rest of that schedule. Rice is a win. Wyoming is a win. You get into the big 12. Like they gave them Houston on the road because we all knew that was coming. <laughs> Making Texas suffer the indignity of playing a conference game against Houston on the road. But I mean, it's, it's not the most impossible schedule in the conference. It's talent wise. Like we think TCU is going to take a slight step back. At least Kansas state's still going to be good, but they've got to come to Austin, Iowa state. I have no idea what they're going to look like this year. It's just Texas is a very talented team. If they get their crap together, there's nobody on their schedule. They can't beat, which I think is something that should be considered when it comes for a turnaround team. We did not have a, in my eyes, we did not have a massive sort of culture type issue, like in some of the discussions that we had at the beginning of uh, this segment at Wisconsin, but that team went seven and six, and that is off the standard from what we expect for the most part from the Badgers over the last five, six year run. So as Luke Fickle, an in, a plus value coach at the highest level, comes in and takes over that program, or the headset in the bowl game, ooh, mm -hmm. he did such a good job wearing that headset. Phil Longo comes in. He's got a couple of quarterback options to, to lead that new look offense. You still have one of the best running backs in the conference and Braylon Allen, who's going to be right there. I have Wisconsin as a team that I think can go from seven and six to contending for a Big Ten championship. Now, in an overall power ranking, the Big Ten, no, I still would slot them behind um, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State. But in the Big Ten West, I think that when you're looking for a first-year bump, big turnaround type situation, Wisconsin came up pretty fast as I was trying to brainstorm candidates because they are playing in the Big Ten West. Their non-conference is Buffalo, Washington State, and Georgia Southern. I think that all of those are wins. They do have to play Ohio State, but the game is in Madison. They avoid Penn State. They avoid Michigan. I see Wisconsin potentially flirting with that 11 win 11 and one playing for a big 10 championship on the first Saturday in December type situation. Yeah. They're the biggest wild card in the big 10 this year. Like they could be a whole lot of different things. The adjustment to the new offense could be very rough. It could be reinvigorating and it could be a huge boost for them in that division. And like I said, when I was talking about Nebraska, again, the big 10 West outside of Northwestern, all these teams are very similar. Similar talent level, similar style of play in a lot of ways. It's going to be a lot of one score games. It's going to look a lot like the division did last year. Like Purdue won the league or the division at six and three, and were followed by Illinois, Iowa, and Minnesota at five and four. And Wisconsin was four and five. And nobody was blowing anybody out. And I think it's going to be very similar to that. Like I think whoever wins this division will probably have two or three Big Ten losses at a minimum. And I do think, though, like I said, Wisconsin is a wild card. If this thing, if this offense, new look, new coaching staff comes in and just is electric and works right from the start, this is a team that could win the division with ease. But I still think it's more likely they'll be if they even if they do win the division, they'd be six and three in the Big Ten and maybe nine and three overall. Do you know who had the best point differential in conference play in the Big Ten West last year? Uh no. The Illinois Fighting Illini. I was going to guess it, but I wasn't one hundred percent sure. Yeah, you were, I mean, you were mentioning that, and I was just like, "Man, every, all all these teams are all Illinois. Here. All Illinois losses were really close. Like a play here and there. Like Indiana, they had the touchdown that was taken away for some reason by the officials. Uh, Michigan, they needed the last second field goal to beat it. It's like, yeah, they, Illinois did not get blown out by anybody. Yeah, it's like plus. Um, 11 was Purdue's in conference point differential, and it was more than 60, more than 70 plus set for uh, for Illinois. Iowa outscored opponents in nine conference games, 168 to 160 plus eight. And uh, Wisconsin, to your point, was just minus 22. Mm -hmm. You know, like 
right there. Uh, even and if even you take away their twenty-four point home loss to Illinois, it was plus two. So, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> my bad. There you go. Uh, <laughs> we will be back Thursday, eleven a.m. Eastern time. Of course. Uh, questions from the big old bag of mail, but also questions from you, the live audience. And we mentioned it last week, but we'll mention it once again. If you cannot hang out with us for the entire show, but you've got a question, here's what you can do at youtube.com slash cover three uh, before the show starts, just jump in there and throw your question in the chat. Of course, you need to be subscribed, smash the like, all those things, but throw your question in the chat. We'll see it. We will star it. We will add it to the live audience uh, portion of the show. So that is yet another way because, you know, we've got Spotify listeners. Uh, we've got listeners across all different audio platforms. And sometimes they say, hey, you know, a five-star review, we'd love to give it to you, but I, I can't get it. And I say, hey, come and join us, youtube.com slash cover three when we do these mailbag episodes. Throw your question in uh, before the show starts. The page itself where the show is hosted is live before we get started. So feel free to do that as another way to get into uh, the mailbag episodes. You can follow him somewhere at Danny Cannell. You can follow him somewhere else at Buddy 3 You can follow him at Tom Fredelli. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Tom, thank you very much. Thank you.